Good afternoon from San Salvador and the U.S. Men's National Team Training Camp ahead of their second group match of the CONCACAF Nations League against El Salvador. Today we'll be joined by goalkeeper Ethan Horvath and head coach Greg Berhalter. If you'd like to get in a queue to ask a question of Ethan, you can do so by virtually raising your hand now. And we'll just begin by saying that Greg has confirmed that Ethan will be the starting goalkeeper for tomorrow night's match against El Salvador. We will begin with questions and start with Stephen Goff from the Washington Post. Hey, Ethan, thanks for joining us. Uh, congratulations on, on getting the start tomorrow. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you look at this uh, goalkeeping core? and heading into the final months leading up to the World Cup. Obviously, we saw Matt start two games, Sean start one. You're going to get a start. Zach, obviously, is in the mix as well. Um, how, do you, how do you look at the, the big picture now? Yeah, it's we're a close group of guys. Um, I'm very happy to get the start tomorrow. It's one of three last games before we head to the World Cup. Um, yeah, and the big picture is, uh, you know, I look at it, my club situation. Um, yes, Nottingham, we got promoted. I don't 100% know what will go on, but um, I think mine and everyone's main focus um, going into these last couple months is uh, playing time and uh, just getting as, ma uh, as many games as possible before Greg makes the final decisions. Next will be Kyle Bonagura from ESPN. Yeah, hi, Ethan. How much has, has Greg told you guys about the importance of having playing time with your club situation to factor into the final decisions? And like, how much do you think that should matter in ultimately deciding who plays in the World Cup? Uh, well, like you said, ultimately the decision is down to Greg himself. Um, uh, I've had a couple conversations with him in the past uh, and of course playing time um, is very important for myself and everybody else um, yeah but at the at the same time you know we're all at good clubs we're all training at very high level um, but I would assume it will be a deciding factor next would be Ryan Talmich from goal.com <clears throat> You mentioned, you know, a few seconds ago there that it, it's a close, close group of guys and guys who have who have been doing this together for a while and have been through that World Cup qualifying process. What are what is that competition like? What competition like? What are those relationships like? What is it like when you watch on with Matt playing or Sean playing or when they watch on with you playing? You know, what is it like being part of that competition, both as a person and a player? Yeah, it's really good. It's it's a healthy competition, you know. Um, uh, if it's Zach, Sean, Matt, or myself playing, um, if it's one of the other three playing, you know, I, I, I want them to do to, to do good, you know. It's it's a team sport, and at the end of the day, we all have the same objectives and the same goals. Uh, and in trainings, you know, we, we have a good time, we, we have laughs, but at the same time, it's also a healthy competition. We get, we get our work done. Um, we want to make each other better. Next will be Daniel Nora from Univision. Thank you, Michael. Uh, hi, Ethan. Thank you for doing this. Uh, your last game was a, in about a year ago. Uh, how much do you think has the team changed in that uh, uh, frame? Uh, I think it's changed quite a lot. Uh, the last game I played was the Costa Rica friendly. And um, I would say for a majority, you know, the team is still the same. Um, I would say maybe we have a handful of new guys uh, this time around. Um, but I would just say I think the team has just grown a lot together. I mean, through the World Cup cycle, um, a lot of the times the same group of guys have been getting called in. So it's not like anybody's new. We've all been together for over a year now. Um, we've all been growing as a family and as a brotherhood. And um, yeah, each each camp we we just grow co closer and closer together. We'll go to Sam Stay School from the Athletic. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Ethan. Ethan, you mentioned your club situation and how you're not really sure what's going to happen. What do you anticipate happening, and, and what what are you what are you looking for? Are you looking for a move? Are you looking to stay with Nottingham? I know there's some uncertainty potentially with with Reece Samba and his situation as well. So, 
What do you want this summer? Uh, yeah, there is the uncertainty, and like I said before, I don't 100% know what will happen, but um, going into this uh, summer period, my main objective is uh, is to play, and I know that, yes, the World Cup is coming around, and um, that is part of the reason why I want to play, but uh, my to be honest, I just want to play to, to play again, to feel the to feel that uh, the the adrenaline and the those butterflies and just that game day feeling day in and day out. So, um, yeah, then we'll we'll see what happens. We're in close contact with Nottingham, and um, yeah, whatever happens happens there. And um, yeah, the main objective is to, to play if that's with Nottingham or somewhere else. Next will be Jonathan Tannenwald from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thanks, Michael. Hi, Ethan. This is admittedly a bit of a change of pace question, um, but for those of us who cover both the men's and women's national teams and see that there are so many great players coming out of the Denver area at the moment, including Highland Ranch specifically, yeah. I was wondering if you might be able to tell us what's in the water out there that's doing this. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, a lot on the women's side from Highlands Ranch, Colorado. But uh, no, um, where 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 I played for Real Colorado, you know, on the women's side, they do a fantastic job. Um, I don't know <laughs> what the secret to success is there, but uh, yeah, all I can say is on the women's side, they do a really good job with developing their players. Thanks. Next would be Sean McCaffrey. You've seen soccer grow in your time, and your father, of course, longer as he played here. You now play under an American, Dane Murphy, who played on the same team as did Haji. How great is that for you to see the Americans being on both shores now? Here uh, and over here? Uh, yeah, I think it's really good. Um, uh, Dane yeah, uh, is very, very young. Um, he did a great job at Barnsley, and obviously he's done a great job at Forest. Um, I, I mean, I think it just shows to not just with Dane, uh, you know, with younger guys coming over to Europe. Um, it just shows that the the mentality and that the the American soccer soccer culture is growing in Europe as well, and um, I think that's just a positive step in the future to show that uh, America is growing as a soccer nation. Last question comes from Andrew Jones. Thanks, Michael. Um, Ethan, first of two questions is, uh, what is the most enjoyable team-building bond that you've had uh, with your teammates here? Reggie Cannon was talking the other day about playing Brendan Harris in a Pokemon and all that. So I wanted to know what has been the most enjoyable team-building experience for you and you being a big fan of the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, what was um, in regards to the Stanley Cup and if Nathan McKinnon and Cole Mocker will bring it home against um, the two-time defending champion likely. Uh, yeah, I hope that they do. Uh, uh, the last time they won it, I think, was act I don't remember the year, but was actually on my birthday whenever they won it. Um, it's been a long time coming. They, they've they gone through some rough patches, but uh, now they – it looks like they found their groove and they found found their way. So I wish them all the best in the in the finals, and I hope they bring it home. And in regards to the team bonding, you know, it's I mean, just left the meal room now, and guys are playing Uno. Um, we're watching the Peru Australia game. Um, like you say, guys play Pokemon. Uh, I saw on the flight yesterday, guys are playing uh, Nintendo Switch. Uh, we're we're in each other's rooms watching Love Island, so it's just <laughs> the 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 brotherhood and the friendships on this team is is growing each camp. You know, it's like it's like I said previously, it's it just keeps growing stronger and stronger because we've been together for so long. We're so young, and um, I think that's going to be a strength of ours going into the World Cup. That's got to be a first Love Island reference here on. Our national team conference calls. Thank you very much, Ethan. We'll be right back with Greg Berhalter. Thanks, guys. And we are back with the head coach of the U.S. men's national team, Greg Berhalter. We'll begin with questions and start with Brian Strauss from Sports Illustrated. Thanks, Michael. Hey, Greg. Hey, Brian. Uh, uh, 
I hope I asked this the right way. It's more of a, a thought, but okay. You you discussed or mentioned a few days ago that a lot of what you're getting from in terms of evaluation is going to happen during the games in this camp, and that you're really watching the players' performance in games closely. How do you evaluate a player's performance when he is not playing alongside or connected with um, more established players that are part of your core and that we're likely going to see in a World Cup? When you're looking at a play, what a, a first-time partnership or a first-time combination, and it may not be something we'll see again, how do you get a sense of how that player might do uh, in November? Yeah, you know, I think that all everyone in this camp is, um, you know, is trying to be an established player. And we have a lot of guys here that have been the core of the team for the last three years. So I'd say that any time a player gets an opportunity w with the national team, um, it, it's an opportunity for him to show that he belongs there and show that, um, you know, he has what it takes to play international soccer. I think when, when you're talking about the detail of chemistry between guys and, you um, you know, guys, you know, certain partnerships working together, you know, that's something that, you know, you, you don't always get in, in in some of the lineups that, that you're playing, but it's still an opportunity for guys to show that they belong to play at, playing at this level. And, and that's something where, you know, it that's an important part of the evaluation process. We'll go to Henry Bush now from Yahoo. Thanks, Michael. Hey, Greg. Hey, um, Henry. Kind of a two-part question about the just the roster decision-making process. First, okay. I'm wondering if you can kind of just give us a little insight into the process. Like we we all as media love to talk about the roster bubble and who's going to make the cut. Like how frequent specifically is that discussion with you and your your staff? Like how, like has that decision-making process already started in your mind? Um, and then the second question, I guess, is like at this point, five months out, do you have a sense for roughly how many of those 26 spots are kind of locked in assuming everybody stays healthy yeah you know um the tricky thing about the national team is is that you know you have to perform each and every time that you're in camp and um so we're our, our focus right now is um you know when we're coming into this camp it was how do we get be better collectively as a team how do we evaluate um players and then how do we start defending our nation's league title and we're very much in the present right now and focused on you know, how do we win against El Salvador? And part of that, part of the, the overall evaluation process will take place, you know, it takes place after each and every game and seeing how players do and seeing how they perform in their position, see if they're um, executing the, the roles um, that we have them on the, based on what we're doing on the field. So all those things are, are daily work. Um, you know, we're not in, in, a, in a position right now where we're saying, okay, this person's locked in or not locked in or this person's out or not, you know, I don't, I don't think we're there yet. But, um, you know, certainly we're using these games to evaluate performances. We'll go to Kyle Bonnegar from ESPN FC. Yeah, hi, Greg. I'm wondering if you could kind of give us a little insight into what the communication process is like between, you know, the end of this camp and in September when you guys meet again. Obviously, there's a a lot of you guys still have to kind of work on between now and then. And then, and then secondly, how much input do you give players who are looking for guidance about potentially transferring to a new club or guys who are already actively working? You know, I have conversations with them, and um, it's mostly about listening and, he and hearing what their ambitions are and, and trying to figure out together with them what, what the best fit would be. But it really is just there to lend an ear. And, um, and give advice where I can. Um, in terms of uh, the first part of the question was what? I missed that one. Stand by, Kyle. Yeah, it was, it was initially, what is the communication? Like oh, yeah, exactly. Yep. So, you know, the, the majority of players in this camp are going to be going back to or start preseason camp soon. So now they have vacation, they have off, and then they're going to go to preseason camp. And we'll let them be for a little bit. Um, you know, I want them to, to relax, to, to get their mind away from soccer. And then as we get into preseason, um, you know, we'll start making contact again. The, the MLS players will continue to monitor them, talk to their clubs, talk to, to, to them for the next weeks, and then really um, focus on, you know, putting together a strong roster that can compete in the September camp. But um, the communication, I think, will, will die down for, for at least the next couple of weeks. We'll go to Stephen Goff from the Washington Post. Thanks, Greg. Um, obviously, the circumstances and the, the opponent will be very different. 
tomorrow than they were Friday in Austin. Um, saying that, what, what would you like to see uh, tomorrow that, that you, maybe you didn't see on Friday in Austin? No, we, you know, we, we're, we're pleased with the game on, um, on Friday. You know, anytime you beat an opponent 5 nothing at any level, I think, is, is good. Anytime you limit them to zero shots on goal, that's important. So, you know, we, we were pleased with that performance. Um, you, know, you, can only, uh, you know, you can only play against your opponent on the field, right? And, and you have to take care of business, and we did that on Friday. We put ourselves in good position. El Salvador will be a different opponent. They'll be more aggressive, but I think they'll be a higher pressing. Um, better counter pressing and away from home. So, you know, for us, it's how do we deal with those elements and then how do we put a good performance in away from home that we've, um, that we haven't always done since we've been together. So, um, you know, that's certainly going to be a challenge for this group. We know it's the last game before we go on, on break from each other and we want to end on a good note. Next is Daniel Nora from Univision. Thank you, Michael. Hi, Greg. Um, uh, I want to ask you about Malik. Uh, yep. He seems kind of frustrated in the last game. I want to know what your evaluation is at this point and if you think that he can bring something different from another position still with the national team. You know, he, he had a um, an injury that he sustained in the match that got worse, and I think that was the frustration you were seeing. Um, he's out for the match against El Salvador. Um, it's unfortunate. But, um, you know, we, we think really highly of him. We're excited about what he can do. He showed... You know, glimpses in that game, glimpses in the in the Morocco game of, of his quality. And, um, you know, now it's about him recovering, getting ready for preseason. Next is Paul Tenorio from The Athletic. Thanks so much, Michael, and thank you, Greg. Um, I wonder, having had a chance to look back at the games now, how you felt when you tinkered with the shape in midfield of dropping a second midfielder a bit deeper, how, how you... Um, liked maybe the, the differences in build up and, and also maybe especially in the early games um, how it helped Christian get into better spots have more space to operate and how you think um, that that change might not just change how you build up uh, with the ball but maybe maybe the spaces that those wingers have to operate in thank you yeah I mean that that's part of the idea um, of making space in a pocket for a guy like Christian but also giving help to a guy like Tyler and build up and, um, you know, we'll see. We, we want to continue to work on that. We think against a certain type of opponent, it could be, um, you know, impactful way to, to create those spaces. And, and we'll continue to push forward and, um, and see how that works. We'll go to Charlie Bone from MLSsoccer.com. Yeah, so uh, my question is right along the lines of Paul's. I was curious about the midfield, central midfield relationships. Uh, what you learned from from those little tweaks you made in the build out and the shape and and what you take forward from from that yeah i think we're still learning you know we want to see see how it um how it affects potentially other defensive shapes and how um we can still create spaces both um between the lines and in wide areas lower wide areas so you know we're going to keep working on on that type of thing um there were moments in the Granada game where, you know, we switched back to a four and one because we didn't need another an extra player in there. And it's just I think about recognizing what type of pressure and recognizing the best formation to to give us um, you know, quick ball circulation and open up spaces between the lines. We'll go to Jonathan Tanawal from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Craig, for the time. Um, this admittedly changes the pace of the question a little bit. But um, Walker had his son in camp in Austin, and we all saw the videos going around and, and such, and of interacting with the other players and all that, and we know that in the new CBA there's going to be a, a, a child care clause for the men's team that there hasn't been before, and I wonder what it would have been like back in your playing days um, if you had been able to have access to that and how important you think it is to have it now. Well, you know, back in our playing days, it was common that, that um, players did bring kids in, into camp. You know, um, mostly it was accompanied by their, their wives and the mothers of the children, but that was really common. You know, we had close bonds with all, all the kids. I remember at the World Cup, you know, there being a, um, a family room where the kids would all be playing soccer. And, and um, you know, I, I think any time, you know, you get to know the families – uh, on a deeper level, the closer you become. You know, I got to meet um, Walker's son for the first time uh, in this camp, and it was, it was great to see him. I got to meet Aaron Long's daughter for the first time. 
And, um, you know, I, I think we want, we preach a type of environment, a family type of environment, and it's nice to, um, you know, to take advantage of that. Next is Brian Charetta from American Soccer Now. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you, Greg, for doing this. Um, two, two players I want to ask you about who came in in wildly different situations. You know, uh, Cameron Carter Vickers won the, champion, won the title in Scotland and got the permanent transfer that he wanted. Uh, how has he done fitting in? He's coming on cloud nine. How, you know, what has been your assessment throughout this whole camp? And then also, obviously on the other clip end, um, Buka De La Torre looked sharp the other day um, against Granada. But... You know, he comes in at a time when the club situation is, is uncertain. How did, Was he able to get beyond that in this camp? I mean, what has been his mood and, and how has he been able to put that aside? Definitely. You know, Luca is, you have two types of scenarios, right? A guy who gets a boost from being in the national team, right? It's not going great for his club, so he comes in the national team and he gets a boost. And you have a player who's doing great with their clubs and they come into the national team and gets that same type of boost. So that's what we're seeing with both of those players. They both have done well in camp. Um, you know, Luca's been around in, in qualifying, so he knows what it's about. Cam hasn't been around that much, but it's been great to see how he adapts and picks up the level really quickly. And I think for both of them, it's been positive camps. Next will be Kyle Bond. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the time very much, Greg. Uh, you, you face the possibility that the top two goalkeepers who many consider to be 1A and 1B in the player pool right now, both being backups at the club level next season. And we just heard from Ethan talk about his situation being a bit uncertain as well. Obviously, it's exciting to have guys playing at the Premier League level. But when you start evaluating not only who you want to bring to the World Cup, but who you want to start in the future, how much do you weigh club minutes in form versus national team experience in form, especially for a form-based position like goalkeeper? Yeah, we have to take them both into consideration. And it, it may not be perfect. It may come down to, um, you know, small differences amongst the group. But, um, you know, right now it's really too early to, to, to give an in-depth comment on it because we just don't know what their situation is going to be. And, um, you know, it's great that Sean's playing and doing really well. And, um, you know, for Ethan and um, for, for Ethan and Matt Turner and Zach, you know, we'll have to just wait and see what happens throughout preseason. Last question comes from Ryan Talmich from Goal.com. Hey, Greg, I was, I was going to ask something somewhat similar to that, but a little bit different. It's okay. just that when you look at the goalkeeper competition, like you said, you have five or six guys, and, and that still needs to sort itself out. Yep. And the way that that third position in particular is usually used is to bring a veteran presence in to hold things down or to bring in a younger goalkeeper who, who can kind of come in and get that experience. For you, is that something that you don't really see as, as a luxury for you? How do you kind of see that, that third goalkeeper spot shaking out or that second goalkeeper? How do you kind of envision the, the type of guys that you're going to need when you do head to a World Cup at that position? I just think, you know, every, every roster spot is going to be carefully considered. And, um, you know, what's worked in the past may not work now. Um, you know, I, I've seen Spain where they've taken a, a really old goalkeeper because he means a lot to the group. I see other teams take young goalkeepers. And for us, nothing's set in stone right now. Um, what we know is we want, um, you know, A, guys that can perform up to the level and B, the guys that are bought into the team ethos and, um, and fit the culture of our group. So, you know, we'll make a decision based on those two um, parameters and, um, you know, hopefully get it right.